Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, now we're going into week two. So today's a pretty big topic, actually. We're going to talk about mood disorders, which is major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. All right, so let me just put this line. Okay, once again, we're going to review this. Any questions about neurons? Anything I need to repeat? Okay, just know that the, the neuron is the functional structure of the brain. A lot of our medications work on this. Just understand that it goes from an electrical stimulus, right? to a chemical stimulus. A chemical stimulus would be your neurotransmitters. So the three important ones that we talk about a lot are your monoamines. Monoamines are serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, all right? Any questions about those neurotransmitters? No. The test will have some neurobiology in there, so don't take it for granted. You know, understand some of the concepts, all right? Know that a lot of the neurotransmission happens in the, the synapse, right? That's where the connection is between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. All right, so remember, if we go some pre to post, that would be called what? What type of neurotransmission? Starts with an A. Anterograde. Anterograde. And if it goes from post to pre, no, that is retrograde, right? Retro is going back. Again, this is just a zoom close up about it. All right, so understand that it's the communication between the, the pre and the post. All right, and there's different ways that the neurotransmitters are recycled. Remember, it has to go inside the presynaptic neuron back, and that's called the transport system, right? You have the CERT, which is responsible for reuptaking the serotonin. You have DAT, which is responsible for, for reuptaking dopamine, right? And you have NET, which is responsible for reuptaking norepinephrine, all right? There's other ones too. There's glycine and there's histamine, but we're going to focus more on that right now. Just a quick review again. Remember, anterior grade. Um, goes from pre to post, all right? That's majority of the neurotransmission that we talk about in psychiatry. Retrograde is going back, which is growth factors, nitric oxide, cannabinoids, all right? Volume neurotransmission, the best example is dopamine in the frontal lobe, all right? We're going to talk a lot about that when we talk about ADHD and why a lot of ADHD meds kind of help with when you stop net, it actually increases dopamine in the frontal lobe. We'll go in detail about that. Mm -hmm. ADHD, all right? These are the targets of the psychotropic drugs. Remember, 12 transmembrane transporters, that would, a good example would be SSRI, right? That would be your fluoxetine, your paroxetine, your sertraline, your escitalopram, your citalopram, those are considered serotonin reuptake inhibitors, all right? SNRIs are serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and that would be your venlafaxine, all right? Or effexor, or your duloxetine, your cymbaltus, all right? Your desvenlafaxine, the prestiques, all right? There's a few of them. G protein link, I gave you some examples here, the D2 receptors. I'm from WSH 701 PCs 002. Uh, please mute yourself. Thank you. Uh, D2, dopamine receptors, example, G protein link 5HT2A is an example, 5HT2C, that gives antidepressant properties also. And some antipsychotic properties, 5HT1A helps with side effects, and 5HT7 helps with depression and cognitive. All right. This is just a brief rundown. We're going to go over this in detail as we talk about specific medications, just have an idea about it. Also work on enzymes. So there's two types of meds that usually work on enzymes in psychiatry. Well, really the main one is MAO, MAO inhibitors. That would be for depression, right? You guys know that. Phenylzine, trinalcipramine, uh, you know, those are older antidepressants, but we still use them now, especially patients who are treatment resistant, all right? Another one that we don't really treat a lot, but you might be familiar with it is in Alzheimer's dementia, right? acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, right? That's an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So when you stop that enzyme, you have more acetylcholine in the cleft, right? And that can help with cognition and memory, okay? Ligand gated channels, an example would be 5-HT3, NMDA, GABA-A norosteroid, which is a new class of medication for use in depression. We can talk about that a little bit later on also, all right? Postpartum depression. Voltage gated ion channels, obviously you know, right? When there's hyperfiring, right? There's too much calcium going inside the cell that can cause seizures, right? There's a, there's a a good um, seizures and mood disorders are pretty much similar. We'll talk about that a little bit later on that when you have one seizure, you're more prone to have seizures, right? So technically, if someone has one period of depression or a period of mania, they're going to be more prone to develop mania or depression also, all right? So anticonvulsants and mood stabilizers are good examples of that, all right? Any questions with that? These are just some examples. Once again, how do neurons adapt to medications? So if you're giving someone a blocker, right? Let's say you're using it for psychosis, you're giving them a D2 blocker, which is G protein, right? What happens to that receptor in the postsynaptic neuron? If you keep blocking it, it's going to upregulate, right? Or it can also become more sensitive. If you're 
agonizing it, let's say in ADHD, you're increasing, you're giving someone an amphetamine, you're increasing the secretion of dopamine. What happens to that postsynaptic neuron to protect itself? It's going to downregulate, right? Which is going to remove receptors. It's going to desensitize. Someone sent me an email from the uh, Anger book about upregulation, desensitization. That book is wrong. <laughs> well, when you guys emailed me, don't worry about that book. It makes no sense what they're talking about, right? Just know what I'm telling you. If you're giving someone a dopamine blocker, the receptor is going to upregulate. If you're giving someone a medication that's going to innervate a neuron, it's going to desensitize and it's going to downregulate, right? That's important. There's a test question of that. That's a hint. Uh, agonist spectrum, G protein ligand, uh, gated channels. So, G proteins and ligand gate ion channels. This is the agonist spectrum, all right? So, at the very end of the spectrum, it's more of an agonist. So remember, an agonist is going to mimic your body's natural neurotransmitter, right? So, that could be dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. So, you're giving a medication that's an agonist, it's going to mimic your body's regular neurotransmitters, all right? A partial agonist is going to be, you know, it's called a stabilizer. So if you guys watch my other YouTube channel from, from uh, last semester, I talked about that in detail. A partial agonist can work both ways. It's called a stabilizer because in the presence of too much agonism, it's going to decrease right, the innervation of that receptor. In the presence of not enough neurotransmitter, it's going to work as an agonist. All right, So it's kind of like a stabilizer. So it's kind of like the Goldilocks principle, if you read the style book. right? It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It kind of balances things out. right? An antagonist is going to block right? But remember, there's still going to be something called intrinsic activity, even if you give someone antagonist. The intrinsic activity is just the regular activity of the cell, just to keep it alive, all right? Inverse agonist is when you actually shut it down. There's, there's no intrinsic activity, all right? If you look at the G protein cascade that they talk about in the book, there's only, the cascade is much smaller when you're giving someone an antagonist, right? It cuts down a little bit. When you give someone an inverse agonist, that G protein cascade in the book is zero. There's no cascade going on. Does that make sense? All right? Don't worry about phosphorylation, kinases, and all that stuff. I'm not going to torture you to have a general idea about it. But at this point in, in your career, you don't have to go into detail about it. All right. I just want you to have a general understanding about how the medications work. When you get to clinicals, then we can talk about it in detail. All right. Any questions about this agonist spectrum? No. This again, this is a review from week one. Pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. All right. Pharmacokinetics, the book says, what does the body do to the medication? All right. How is the body absorbing the medication? How is the body distribu distributing the medication? Metabolism obviously has to do with the CYP enzymes, right? CYP. And excretion. Usually it's the kidneys, but you can excrete through your blood and through your sweat also, right? There's different types of excretion. Um, so pharmacokinetics, there's like five or six CYP enzymes I want you guys to know. In psychiatry, the most important one really is 2D6. All right. Just know that. Uh, 2D6 is one of the most prevalent uh, CYP enzymes because a lot of our medications are substrates of 2D6. In general medicine, it will be 3A4, all right? Uh, 2C9 would be Depakote and you know, some of the other antidepressants. 2C19 is Sertraline, Lexapro, Escitalopram. Those are just common 2C19 medications. Uh, 1A2, Olanzapine, Clozapine, Acenapine, Haldol. Those are just some 1A2 medications. I'm saying it fast because it's being recorded. You can listen to me say this again if you want to play it back later, all right? Um, 1B2, Methadone is 1B2. Wellbutrin is 1B2, and sertraline is also partially 1B2, all right? So any medication that inhibits 1B2, in theory, you can increase methadone levels, right? More sedation, higher, you know, higher side effects, all right? Sertraline also, if you inhibit 1B2, sertraline levels can go up. And um, the other 1B2 is Wellbutrin. One, Wellbutrin is also 1B2 substrate, all right? Any questions? No, okay. Pharmacodynamics, how does the medication work in the body, all right? Someone has psychosis, I want to block dopamine receptors. I want to give them a D2 antagonist. So that would be pharmacodynamics, right? Someone is having issues with focus. No. I want to increase dopamine. Yes, question. No. Okay. Pharmacodynamics, someone is having anxiety. I want to increase serotonin, giving them an SSRI because there's an inverse relationship with increasing serotonin, kind of dampens down your amygdala, right? Sometimes when people are anxious or they're having panic attacks, they have a hyperfiring amygdala, which is the emotional part of your brain. One way we can do that is there's a connection with serotonin there. So when serotonin binds to the amygdala, it kind of calms it down. All right. All right. Uh, so this is just some parts of the brain that you guys should understand. All right. Dorsal striatum, we should know that because that is implicated in movement disorders. All right. So that would be the nigrostriatal area, right, which is the VTA. Oh, I'm sorry, from the substantia nigra to the basal ganglia. All right, so you need dopamine there. When you give someone a dopamine blocker, it's going to affect that striatum, which is the movement area, right? You need dopamine for fine movements. 
So what happens when you're giving someone antipsychotic? They might have tremors. They might have bradykinesia, slower movement, all right? The opposite of that too, you give someone too much dopamine and someone's on cocaine, they have spastic movements, right? They could be aggressive, moving very quickly. So think about that balance, all right? Prefrontal cortex or dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, cognition, focus, attention, right? Two types of attention. You have sustained attention, which you guys are doing now, right? Listening to me and you're it's sustained. And you have selective attention. Selective attention means that if you were listening to me right now and someone wanted to mow their lawn, right? Or cut their grass and you heard the sound of them cutting their grass. All of a sudden you're distracted and you can't go back on task and listen to me and you're staring out the window, right? That would be an issue with selective attention. So we can do selected attention in ADHD. Sometimes we do something called the Stroop test. Anyone heard of a Stroop test before? S-T-R-O-O-P, Stroop test. Stroop test means that they have you sit in front of a computer, right? And, and there's two ways you can do it. You're going to give them words and the words are colors, yellow, blue, red, right? And I might tell the patient, I want you only to say what you're reading, not what you're what you're seeing. So you might see the color red, I mean the name red, but it might be in yellow. And the, per the person blurts out yellow or the opposite. The word says yellow, but the color is in red and they say the opposite, right? So you need to work selected attention because you need to block out what's extraneous, right? Which is telling yourself not to blurt out what you see, but what you're reading, which can be more difficult. Someone who has ADHD has a difficult time doing that, right? So if someone fails that test, that would be an issue with selected attention, all right? Sustained attention, we do, uh, you know, tell me the months backwards, all right? December, November, October, September, August, going backwards or the alphabet backwards. Or we, if they're not good at reading and they're good at math, you can do serial seven subtractions, right? Starting from 100, I'm going to start it first. You're going to subtract seven. So 93, right? 86, 79, and so forth, right? And, and they're going to have to work sustained attention and try to get all the way down. So if they have issues with the negative sevens or serial sevens, that will be an issue with sustained attention. Any questions with that? No? Okay. I mentioned the amygdala. The amygdala is very important because that's the emotional part of your brain, right? That's implicated in panic attacks. That's also implicated in anxiety, trauma, right? Fear, phobia. A lot of that is hyperactive amygdala, all right? Nucleus accumbens, that's good to know because that's your pleasure area. That's also implicated in psychosis. So the nucleus accumbens, another name for it is called the ventral striatum, all right? So VTA to ventral striatum or VTA to nucleus accumbens is your mesolimbic area. That's going to be too hot, too much dopamine in psychosis, all right? So if I ever tell you someone has a hyperactive nucleus accumbens, two things should come in mind. One, they're abusing something, right? And they're addicted to it because that's your pleasure area. Or number two, they could be psychotic or manic, too much dopamine, all right? If I said someone had a hyperfiring amygdala, you would think, okay, maybe there's some kind of anxiety disorder, all right? Hypothalamus. Endocrine is involved, but for psychosis, uh, the hypothalamus connects to the pituitary gland, and that would cause, I mentioned it last week, elevated prolactin, right? If you block dopamine, what happens? Prolactin goes up, and something someone can have something called hyper-elevated prolactin, hyperprolactinemia, all right? If you're a female, you might have irregular periods or amenorrhea, no period, can conceive, can have kids. Long-term could be you know, osteoporosis, all right? For a male, gynecomastia, sexual dysfunction. All right, there's a few more, but those are the most common ones that we see. Hippocampus memory, obviously, the connection between your hippocampus, if you had bad memories, if you're traumatized in the past, your connection to your amygdala might be very strong. So you're reminding by something, right? Your hippocampus innervates your amygdala, and therefore it's going to hyperfire. That can show up as flashbacks, nightmares, all right? Hyperarousal, people are hypervigilant. They're looking left and right all the time because they're very scared, all right? Ventral tegmental area is the cell body where your dopamine is produced, right? You see that there? So just know that. If I asked you a question, uh, you know, what is the VTA for? That's that's where a lot of your dopamine is produced. So VTA and substantia nigra are the two main cell bodies where dopamine is produced in your body, all right? Raphae, raphae nuclei or raphae nucleus is the cell body that produces a lot of your serotonin, all right? Um, it's not in here, but also the locus, L-O-C-U-S, ceruleus, is the cell body that produces norepinephrine, all right? Corpus callosum is important because that's implicated in trauma sometimes. So corpus callosum is a layer of your brain that connects your left side and your right side, all right? Sometimes when people are having seizures, they actually cut the corpus callosum because what happens is when people are having seizures, it goes from one side to the other and they do something like corpus callostotomy and they, they cut your corpus callosum and people don't have seizures anymore. Of course, it's, you know, side effects of that is very bad, but still happens sometimes, all right? Corpus callosum connects your left hemisphere to your right hemisphere. 
All right, cerebral cortex is the largest part of your brain. Your cortex is a lot of your uh, your sensory, your motor. Cerebral cortex is the largest part of your brain, all right? And that's also part of like, you know, your lobes, frontal lobe, focus, or parietal lobe, association, temporal lobe, right? Hearing, auditory, making sense of stuff. Occipital lobe in the back is memory sensor and balance, all right? So you should know that. Any questions so far? I'm just giving you a basic 10 minute neuroanatomy neurophysiology class, but this is just a general idea. If you need more details, I can go in that also. Monoamine hypothesis of depression. All right. This has kind of like been debunked in a way, but not really. Uh, because you know, obviously, you know, depression is a very complicated illness. It's more than just not enough serotonin, not enough norepinephrine, not enough dopamine. All right. Because they have done, there are some people that when they do um tyrosine depletion. So tyrosine depletion means that they remove tyrosine from their diet because you need tyrosine to make serotonin, that those patients actually are more prone to depression, right? The argument is that when you do that to other patients, they deplete tyrosine, they don't get depression, right? But the interesting thing is the patients that have a past history of depression and you deplete tyrosine, they actually become depressed again, all right? So that can mean many things. You can infer many things from that, but it's possible that those people that are having tyrosine depletion that don't have enough serotonin, their type, quote unquote, of depression is a monoemergic, you know, deficiency, right? Some other people's depression might not be that, right? It could be from too much inflammation, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. All right. But just know that there are people that respond to SSRIs, SNRIs. So maybe their type of depression is that. But we can't make a blanket statement, you know, and say that depression is because of that. All right. I try not to use that anymore. Some people still say, but don't tell your patients that they're depressed because they don't have enough serotonin, nor enough dopamine. That's not really true. All right. That hypothesis, just a little bit of history, is because there was a medication back in the day called reserpine, which is an irreversible BMAT inhibitor. All right. I told you guys before, anything that doesn't go inside BMAT is not safe, right? If a, if a neurotransmitter doesn't go inside the VMAT, which is the vesicle, it gets eaten up by monoamine oxidase, right? So what happened was the patients that were getting reserpine, a lot of the neurotransmitters were not going inside the VMAT and they were getting eaten up and it caused depression. So that, you know, I, get, I don't know the name of the person, but one person kind of saw that and realized, wait a second, if you're giving someone reserpine and all of their monoamines are being depleted, maybe, which makes sense, uh, you know, depression is caused by not enough monoamines, right? But that's not really true with all patients, like I said. Any questions? No? Okay. Malfunctioning brain uh, circuits and depression. All right. Again, prefrontal cortex. Just know that in frontal low prefrontal cortex, same thing. Uh, pa pa patients will have poor concentration. All right. Concentration can be broken up to sustained attention or um, selective attention. All right. Mental fatigue, guilt, worthlessness, suicidality. That's all implicated in your frontal lobe. All right. Doesn't really meet with medications. It doesn't really make much difference. But when you do use like certain treatments like TMS, where they have to put the, the magnets on your head, they might target, depending on the patient's symptoms, specific parts of the brain where they connect those electrodes. So you might not be doing that unless you, you want to do TMS. But, you know, it's good to understand the associations with the brain. All right. Nucleus accumbens, like I said, that has to do with pleasure. So if you have issues with dopamine and nucleus accumbens, you might have anhedonia. Anyone know what anhedonia means? What is anhedonia? What, is e what does hedonism mean? It's the opposite of hedonism. Like lack of, lack pleasure. of pleasure. Things. Very good. Very good. Lack of pleasure, right? Things that. So a good way to ask a patient that they have anhedonia is, tell me something that you used to enjoy doing and do you still find pleasure in doing that, right? And most likely they'll probably say no. I used to like playing baseball, but I just don't like doing it anymore, right? Or I'll tell patients, if I gave you a million dollars right now, how would you feel? Patients who are depressed, like, you know what? I don't know. I don't think I would be that happy, all right? Because they can't find pleasure there. Decreased interest, all right? Low motivation, all right? We call that the three A's sometimes, anhedonia, abolition, energia, low energy, all right? That's all kind of linked together. And sometimes that's depression, all right? The striatum, dorsal striatum in particular, psychomotor fatigue, all right? You might ask patients, does it take you a lot of energy just to get out of bed, all right? Some patients might take them 20 minutes because they even just getting the blanket off their chest takes a lot of energy, that, that psychomotor fatigue. It might manifest as psychomotor retardation or bradykinesia, all right? Hypothalamus, that's sleep and appetite changes, all right? So that affects your hypothalamus, all right? Someone has hypersomnia, sleeping too much, or insomnia, not able to fall asleep, all right? Appetite changes, are they eating too much? Or are they eating too little, right? Some people have the opposite, right? I know some people who are depressed and when they're depressed, they try to cope with eating too much. Some people are depressed and they don't want to eat. So it really depends on the patient, all right? 
Cerebellum, psychomotor effects, right? Everyone knows the cerebellum. You're off balance, ataxia, can't control your muscle movements, right? That could be a side effect as well. Any questions so far? No? Okay. All right. So I'm going to explain this again because some of you emailed me and you weren't sure about the effect of down regulation, up regulation, how it happens in depression. All right. So if you give someone a serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac or fluoxetine, all right, so that... Uh, this is the presynaptic neuron, and that little bump that you see in the right is the postsynaptic neuron, all right? So we have these things called autoreceptors on neurons because they're like shutoff valves. It, it protects your body from excitotoxicity, all right? Excitotoxicity means too much stimulation. So what happens is when you're innervating a neuron too much, it can actually kill off that neuron because it gets too, it, it's called excitotoxicity. It, it's, it's too much stimulation. It doesn't know what to do. So what your body does is it has, in order to maintain homeostasis is that it has um, these autoreceptors with our shutoff valves. So once a certain amount of serotonin, right, goes to, so in this example, it's 5-HT1A is at the very front of the neuron, right? Where those little spikes are, where the little hair things are, right? When you give the serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it's actually going to work in that cleft, which is on the very right side. You see that circle with the red? Over time, as the serotonin builds up, when you give someone an SSRI, a lot of that serotonin is going to start drifting backwards, all right, and it's going to keep binding to the autoreceptors, which are on the very front of the neuron. Those are the 5-HT1A autoreceptors. What happens, like I said, is when serotonin keeps binding to those 5-HT1A autoreceptors, they're going to what? They're going to downregulate and desensitize, right? That means they're going to stop working, and there might be even less of them. What happens when you desensitize and you shut off those autoreceptors? That presynaptic neuron is going to be free to secrete a bunch of neurotransmitters, right? So it's called disinhibiting. Because usually it inhibits, so you disinhibit it, therefore it's going to be free to release, all right? That could be an explanation as to why it takes two to four weeks for a lot of our antidepressants to work, all right? Because if it was just a simple case of not having enough monoamines, once you give them one SSRI, you're increasing serotonin already, right? How come the depression isn't getting better? So one of the theories is that maybe it's a down regulation of the autoreceptors, which could take weeks, right? Because it's G-protein mediated, takes a while, and then that's when the patients see effect. Does that make sense? All right. So that's down regulation of the autoreceptors, which is called disinhibition, which eventually will cause that presynaptic neuron to disinhibit and it'll be free to secrete uh, a bunch of serotonin. All right. It'll flood it, which could take up to a month sometimes. All right. Any SSRI or SNRI or even DNRI does the same thing. I have a quick question. Yes. yes. So then do the autoreceptors that are producing all the serotonin, do they ever get exhausted and stop working? Yeah, that's what's happening. You're making them exhausted and stop working. You want them to. Okay. Yeah, so the medication is causing them to downregulate and turn off because you're increasing serotonin to stimulate them. So in the very beginning, you're actually doing the opposite. You're decreasing serotonin because it hits those autoreceptors and there's going to be a shutoff valve, right? It's going to shut off. But over time, as you keep hitting that shutoff valve with serotonin because you're continuing to give them the medication exogenously, right? That yeah. autoreceptor is going to shut off, like you said. It's going to turn off. So therefore, when it turns off, there's no shutoff valve. That presynaptic neuron is free to innervate that postsynaptic freely with no shutoff valve. Okay. And, and then that's... it just continues to keep going. Yeah, it continues to keep going. Yep, exactly. Okay. Thank okay. you. No problem. Okay, so this is... A... I'm going to explain this because this can get a little complicated. So HPA is another theory of depression, all right? H stands for hypothalamic, P stands for pituitary, right? And A stands for adrenal. So the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, all right? So that's a feedback loop. Normally, let's say, for instance, if you're walking outside and a car almost hits you, right? What's going to happen is your HPA axis is going to is gonna work a little bit. Your hypothalamus is going to tell your pituitary gland to secrete ACTH, and then your kidneys are, are going to secrete cortisol, right, from the adrenal gland on the kidneys, right? That adrenal gland is going to innervate your fight or flight response, right? Which make you, you might jump on the curb, you might run away, you might scream and yell, but that's protective, right? You need that. After a while, if, you, if that keeps happening and you keep stimulating your HPA access, what's going to happen? It's going to desensitize and shut off, kind of like the receptors in your brain, right? So you do have, you have um, cortisol receptors that hit your brain that actually tells your hypothalamus to shut off. So it's a feedback loop, right? Your adrenal gland is, is going to treat cortisol. Enough cortisol hits your bloodstream, makes it up to your brain. It's going to say, you know what? There's enough cortisol in my body. Please shut it down. Hypothalamus is going to shut off, right? That's, that's a safety, similar to the serotonin neuron. But what happens when people have trauma, right? Sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse that keeps happening over time, 
your HPA access is going to keep overproducing, right? So those, that shutoff valve, which is a negative feedback loop of your cortisol receptors are what? They're going to desensitize and going to shut off. So your hypothalamus will not know to shut off and it's going to keep secreting cortisol, all right? Long-term cortisol use, which is the stress hormone, can cause shrinkage of your hippocampus, right? Once your hippocampus shrinks, it affects the rest of your brain and therefore people will be predisposed to depression, all right? Because a lot of people with depression do have a shrinkage in, the, in their hippocampus, right? Is that having any questions there? All right, so that's the pathway that will lead to shrinkage of parts of your brain, all right? One part that shrinks is your hippocampus. All right, because that's because there's too much cortisol released by your adrenal gland, which shuts off the negative feedback loop because over time, the cortisol keeps flooding those cortisol receptors and the cortisol receptors are gonna shut off, all right? Hypotrophy, shrinkage of the hippocampus will lead to depressive symptoms. This is another one, all right? This is not a hypothesis, all right? Chronic stress, systemic inflammation. So there is a new theory now that's coming out that too much inflammation can actually cause people for depression, all right? Inflammation can be checked. So sometimes you might do blood tests. You can check, uh, you know, TNF alpha. You can do interleukin testing also, which could be pretty expensive, but these are called pro-inflammatory cytokines, all right? When your body has inflammation, these cytokines will be increased in production. So you can actually do blood testing, we'll show you. And what will happen eventually, this is... I'm going to try to simplify it. Just know that over time, what happens is that normally your brain, your blood brain barrier is not permeable, right? It's not permeable because you don't want certain things to go inside your brain because your brain is very important to your living, right? So what happens after a while, um, too much inflammation will cause your brain, your blood brain barrier to kind of break down a little bit. And then some, your white blood cells will actually start, will start attacking parts of your brain, all right? So that's the microglia activation. So the microglia will actually go inside your brain and start... Once again, similar to overactive, uh, you know, hypothalamic pituitary axis, it'll cause shrinkage of parts of your brain and will lead to depression, all right? Don't worry about quinolonic acid, decreased serotonin. Just know the general idea that chronic inflammation will affect your immune system and cause your immune system to attack your brain, all right? It, it permeates into your blood-brain barrier and can cause shrinkage of your brain, all right? Um, I have a question. About roughly how long does it take for that shrinkage to happen over time? Like, is it like something that happens over years or someone's lifetime? Uh, yeah, usually it takes sometimes years. Yeah, but it depends because there's other factors like um, resilience, right? Resilience is, is is hereditary. Some people are more resilient than others. So someone who has more resilience, right, who has more, their personality is more like, you know, they don't have a very... Uh, neurotic personality, right? They're more laid back, more type B, more relaxed. They might be able to kind of like get through that a little bit and it won't be as bad, but someone who's more neurotic, more type A, you know, more sensitive, it might happen in a couple of months. So there's many factors. So it could be a couple of months to a couple of years or maybe one experience, right? We've all met people that had one, uh, mm -hmm. you know, traumatized one time with one thing and they can't get over it, right? They have to go to therapy. Some people who have undergone years of trauma and it took years of trauma until it actually affected them right there's actually some interesting studies with, with war veterans and it was war veterans who experienced combat not all of them developed ptsd right you would think like they all had firefights they all some of them got injured not all of them developed ptsd maybe only 30 percent of them did there was another 70 percent that didn't what are the factors resilience right personality traits Major depressive disorder. So even though this isn't a class in diagnosing, okay, your case study, by the way, some of you guys are like over, over reading it. So since this isn't a diagnosing class, a lot of your case studies will be very straightforward. We're going to give you the diagnosis. All right. So it's assume we give you the diagnosis, just go right to treatment. All right. I know you guys ask very good questions about like, you want to um, tailor the medications based on the symptoms of the patient, but we're going to go more with that in your, in your next classes, once you guys go to clinicals. Right now, just pick any SSRI, SNRI, Wellbutrin, doesn't really matter. And just give me rationales to why you chose that med, right? They can't, they can't take tricyclics because of the side effect. You have a handful of other meds you can choose. Just make sure you cite it with references. It's, a pretty, it's very straightforward, trust me, very easy. All right, don't, don't overread it. As you, guys get, as you guys progress through the program, then I'll tell you, patient has energia, patient has sexual dysfunction, patient has insomnia, which best medication might treat those symptoms, right? But this early on, we'll, we'll keep it very general. So any SSRI, you, you pick and choose, just make sure you back it up with as evidence, all right?
CG caps is a pretty good mnemonic. Um, this is the one I used to use when I first started practicing. So S stands for sleep. Remember, sleep is very important. Before you even want to treat someone for any diagnosis, you want to regulate sleep, right? Because someone who's not sleeping can look psychotic. Anyone who's not sleeping can have symptoms of ADHD. Anyone who's psychotic, who, who's not sleeping, can look like they're depressed, right? So if you're not addressing sleep, you know, you, you can't really diagnose someone with everything because sleep affects everything, right? So get them to sleep first, all right? Interest, anhedonia, decreased pleasure, all right? Guilt, some people feel guilty about them being depressed. They feel like they're a burden to their family. So you can ask them that. Do you feel shame that you're in the hospital? Do you feel like, you know, you're, because the thing is if they have overwhelming guilt, they're also at risk for suicide, right? They're like, oh my God, I'm such a burden for everybody. Maybe, maybe better off I wasn't here. So make sure you assess for guilt, all right? Energy. Sometimes patients are so depressed and they are suicidal. The reason why they don't actually kill themselves is because they have energia, right? So be careful because you might give them an SSRI or a medication for depression. And sometimes the energy will come back first, but the suicidality and, you know, the depression is still there. So they're at higher risk of committing suicide. All right. So remember, symptoms don't subside at the same time. That's why you want to check in on patients, you know, usually weekly. When I first prescribe a medication, I want to check in with them right away, the week after, especially teenagers, all right? They're at higher risk for that. So once they start their med, right? Because if they get energy, if they get that burst of energy, but they're still suicidal, they're still depressed, they're at higher risk of suicide, all right? Concentration, all right? You can ask them, is it affecting you? Anyone, I don't know, anyone ever take a test uh, during a breakup? I'm sure everyone's experienced that, right? How hard was it to do an exam or do something, right? So imagine undergoing a breakup for six months or three weeks, can't focus, can't take a test, right? So that's how concentration feels when you're depressed right? Appetite. Like I said, appetite can go either ways. Hyperphagia or very little eating, all right? Psychomotor changes, bradykinesia or psychomotor retardation, slow movement, right? Or hyperkinetic or psychomotor agitation, moving very quickly, all right? That could also be mania, so make sure you screen for mania, all right? The symptoms do not meet criteria for mixed episode. So mixed episode means they have some hypomania or manic symptoms there, all right? Because what happens if you give someone an SSRI who has bipolar? You can cause them to, to become manic, or you can cause something called a mixed symptom, which will have depression and mania. It's very hard to treat. You don't want that to happen, all right? And remember, symptoms need to cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of functioning, all right? So just because someone meets criteria for a certain disorder, even though it's unlikely, there has to be some kind of functioning impairment, all right? If not, then usually we don't treat, because then what's the point of giving some medication if there's no impairment? You don't really see that, but... I guess it's important to highlight. Make sure that there's no substances involved, right? Is someone taking a depressant like alcohol or abusing benzos? And that's why they're depressed. And obviously you wouldn't give them a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. You want to make sure you treat the underlying substance disorder first, all right? Are the symptoms better not accounted for by bereavement or, you know, adjustment disorder? Do they not lose their job or have a breakup or, you know, have a divorce or something, right? Any questions? Okay, these are the medications that we use for major depressive disorder, all right? I really want you guys to memorize the generic name because generics never change, but brand names do change. So just know that whenever I talk about sertraline, that would be Zola, right? So Talipran, try not to write brand names because those can change sometimes, all right? All right, sertraline. I'm gonna give you guys some, some clinical pearls about each medication, all right? So just so you know how to distinguish them. Sertraline is a good medication because it's one of the safest medications for patients who are older who have cardiac issues, all right? So a lot of patients who have blood pressure medications who have cardiac comorbidities as they get older, sertraline is one of the safest medications. If you, if you look it up on, Med, on PubMed, uh, on MedPub or PubMed, uh, there's gonna be a lot of studies that validate that, that sertraline is safest. It also doesn't have a lot of drug-drug interactions except if you go to 150 milligrams. So if you go to 150 milligrams of sertraline, it could be an inhib inhibitor similar to Prozac. So just be careful if you go on 150 milligrams for anxiety, or OCD, because it could affect the other medications, all right? Citalopram and escitalopram are enantiomers of each other. You know what enantiomers are from chemistry? They're like mirrors of each other, all right? Um, know that citalopram, all right, and escitalopram are both metabolized by 2C19, and they both could be cardiotoxic at higher doses. So escitalopram at 20 milligrams, you should order an EKG at least yearly, all right? Citalopram at 40 milligrams, you should order EKGs yearly, all right? 
And they're the only real SSRIs that are truly serotonergic and they don't have any drug drug interactions, all right? Paxil, paroxetine. A lot of prescribers don't like it. I'm one of them. I don't like to prescribe it too much because it has a very short half-life. So what does that mean? If a medicine has a short half-life, people are prone to what? If they miss the dose, what are they prone to? Feeling withdrawal symptoms. Very good, right? So any medication that has a short half-life, once you stop the medication, the plasma levels are going to drop because of the half-life and they'll have you know, seroton serotonin withdrawal, all right? Uh, Paxil also, besides having short half-life, it's very anticholinergic. So people will have, you know, constipation, blurred vision. It's very antihistamine. People might be sedated. And it also blocks nitric oxide, which is why it causes sexual dysfunction. It's one of the few meds that causes very bad sexual dysfunction, right? It blocks nitric oxide. It's very anticholinergic. It's very antihistamine. So the, the side effect profile is not very good. It used to be believed that since it was anticholinergic antihistamine, it might be good for anxiety. So you'll still see it for patients who have very bad anxiety. Some primary care doctors might still prescribe it. Some old school psychiatrists might still prescribe it. But I tend to stay away from it unless a patient is doing gets transferred to me and says you're doing well on it, then I'll continue it. But it wouldn't be my first choice. Prozac, fluoxetine, has the longest half-life of our uh, medication. The half-life of Prozac is about one week, all right? So if, if you think about that, um, you know, hit steady state, it's five half-lives, right? So five weeks. It, it, it takes five weeks of Prozac to hit steady state. So therefore, Prozac might be a good medication for patients who miss doses once in a while, right? Because of the long half-life, it self-tapers also. So Prozac is one of the SSRIs that you can just stop cold turkey. You don't have to taper it because it's such a long half-life, it self-tapers itself. It just washes out, all right? A technique that I usually use if someone is on Effexor or Paxil, they want to get off the medication, right? Because they have such a short half-life, a technique I use is I bridge them to Prozac. So what I'll say is, okay, we'll bridge you from Paxil to Prozac. And once five, five week hits and Prozac hits steady state, we'll just stop the Prozac and it'll wean off itself, right? Because you're giving them a long half-life serotonergic medication that will self-taper. Because if you don't do that, sometimes this isn't patients on SNRIs like Effexor or, or will realize this or duloxetine, Cymbalta. They have to start like going every other day dosing or, or crushing it, putting it in water. And then you have to like really get off it because getting down from like 37.5 to zero is very difficult. All right. It's called a hyperbolic taper. Have you guys heard that before? Hyperbolic taper means that if you go from like 150 milligrams of Effexor to 75, it might be okay, right? You might be only losing 10% of your serotonin pumps, right? Being blocked. Once you go from like, 75 to zero, the drop of your serotonin transports not being inhibited, right? Gets much more. So people have, are more sensitive to side effects, right? Because you would think if you went from 150 of Effexor to 75 of Effexor, you would think since you're going half, you would be, you would be missing out on 50% of your SNRI pumps, right? Your net and your serotonin pumps being blocked, right? It makes sense, 50-50, but it's not. That mean it doesn't go by that. It's not dose dependent. So what happens is going from 150 to 75 milligrams, you might only lose 25% of your SSRI or SNRI pumps. Going from 75 to zero, it's much bigger drop. So therefore people are more prone to side effects, if that makes sense. It's not dose dependent. All right, so as you go lower on the dosing, you have to go much lower on the taper. That means hyperbolic tapering. So you might be able to go from 150 to 75 and patients are fine. But once you go to 75 to 37.5, you have to go from 37.5 to maybe cutting that in half, half of 37.5 to a quarter to one eighth, right? And you keep reducing it slower and slower because people can't get off it at that lower dose. That's called a hyperbolic taper, all right? Venlafaxine is an SNRI. Okay, sorry, fluvoxamine, Luvox. Luvox is only FDA approved for OCD. All right. It can be used off label for GAD and for uh, depression, but we tend to use it more for OCD. It's it's only approved for that. But I have seen people use it for other things. The only thing about Luvox is it's a 1A2 inhibitor. All right. The reason why that's important, I'm going to give you an example. I had a patient who had treatment resistant OCD, right? We tried fluoxetine. I went all the way up to 60, no response. I put her back, I put her on Zoloft, went all the way up to 300 milligrams of Zoloft, there was no response. Before I wanted to add an atypical antipsychotic, which sometimes could be used for treatment resistant OCD, I said, let's try Luvox, Luvoxamine. She was 22 years old, college student, you know, very engaged in her studies, 
what are college students notorious for drinking to get through the classes? Coffee, right? So she would have two to four cups of coffee during the day. Coffee is a 1A2 substrate, right? You need 1A2 to break caffeine down. So when I put her on Luvox, she started telling me she was having really bad panic attacks and she doesn't know why, right? In my mind, if I didn't know that the caffeine was a 1A2 substrate, I would probably say, well, Luvox is an SSRI. Maybe you're having very bad anxiety. Let me increase your serotonergic medication, right? But it's the Luvox interacting with caffeine that's gonna cause that. So what happened if I increase the Luvox? Caffeine's gonna go up even more. And what's gonna happen? Anxiety's gonna go up even more, right? So it's gonna make things worse. And who knows, maybe if I didn't know any better, I would have put this patient on clonopin or a benzo, right? In polypharmacy for no reason. So what I did was I asked her, I said, okay, you're a college student, do you drink coffee? Yes, how many cups of coffee do you drink? Four cups a day, all right. Why don't you try to cut it down to two cups a day and see what happens? She got it down to two cups, her panic attacks got much less. I say, let's do one cup now. One cup of coffee, she still gets the same effect. Luvac is working and her OCD got down. See what I mean? It's a pharmacokinetic interaction. But if you didn't know that interaction, you, you're keep, you keep adding meds, treating a side effect which you think is a symptom, which you caused in the first place. Does that make sense? All right, so I am giving. I gave her Luvac, which is an SSRI for OCD, which she was a college student. She was drinking a lot of, of coffee, right? Caffeine is a 1A2 substrate. She took Luvac, which is a 1A2 inhibitor. It inhibits SIP enzymes of 1A2, which is gonna increase caffeine levels. She started having panic attacks. If I didn't know that interaction, I would have learned, I would have thought, well, school taught me that SSRIs dial down the amygdala, right? So I would have tried the pharmacodynamic way increasing serotonin, which would have made things worse, increase caffeine even more, right? But since I was aware of that pharmacokinetic interaction, I asked her about her caffeine use and I made her cut it down. Now the Luvac is fine and she's OCD is actually in total control, all right? Does that make sense? So it's many, many concepts that I'm teaching you all in a good example. So that's why it's important to know, okay? Venlafaxine affects her, SNRI, all right? So serotonin has to do with mood, helps with anxiety, right? What do you think norepinephrine does? If you increase norepinephrine, what will, what will help? What symptoms might get better? Like low energy. Very good, energia, right? Concentration as well, right? So if someone's complaining about concentration issues, complaining about energia, focus attention, maybe SNRIs might not be a bad idea, all right? So Effexor is a, is a medication you can use as well, all right? Duloxine is also an SNRI. All right, and sometimes you might see that in patients who have uh, co-occurring neuropathic pain or any type of pain, all right? Because remember, your pain pathways that go up from your spinal cord and dorsal root ganglion, right? Norepinephrine goes down also, which inhibits it. So what happens when you increase norepinephrine? Your norepinephrine going down the pathway is gonna dull down the pain response. So when you increase norepinephrine, it's gonna dull the pain response, all right? That's why sometimes you see duloxetine. If you can remember, duloxetine, dull, D-U-L, uh, can help with neuropathic pain or pain symptoms. All right, you might, neurologists use that sometimes too. Be careful if someone's seeing a neurologist and, and they say they're getting a medication for pain, make sure you, you have them specified because they might not tell the neurologist they're being treated for depression. You might have them on Prozac, right? And neurologist puts them on duloxetine and you have technically two serotonergic medications, what are they at risk for? Serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome, right? Which you might see with hyperreflexia right? Very hyperactive reflexes, all right? Autonomic instability, blood pressure is going to go up and down, all right? You might have some confusion. A lot of the early signs of serotonin syndrome will actually be hyperreflexia. They'll have very spastic reflexes or clonus. Clonus is like the movements of the feet or the arms will go circular inside. That's called clonus, all right? Amitriptyline, it's a tricyclic antidepressant. They don't really use tricyclics anymore, but I use it in some patients who don't respond. The thing about tricyclics is they hit more uh, neurotransmitters, all right? So tricyclics work on serotonin, norepinephrine, and they also work on sodium and uh, calcium channels, all right? They're also antihistamine, anticholinergic. Sometimes you might need that. Someone has insomnia, uh, you know, you might want to give them a tricyclic because it might help them sleep, all right? So S they're, they're like SNRIs combined with uh, channel blockers, all right? Antihistamine, anticholinergic too. Right. Imipramine is a very strong anticholinergic medication. Sometimes you might see that if you do pediatric psych, and I might see that with some of my patients who have, uh, you tell me, it's anticholinergic. So what do kids experience that sometimes you might need to give them anticholinergic? What do they do? Kids who have trauma as well. Bedwetting. Very good, bedwetting, right? So they give them that because imipramine, 
is a very strong anticholinergic. Uh, doxepine, disipramine, I don't see that as much. So just know it's tricyclic. Do doxepine, you use that for sleep. You see that low dose, doxepine for sleep. All right. Nortriptyline is also sometimes used still for depression. Uh, it's one of the most, nortriptyline and disipramine are probably the most tolerated tricyclic. Those are the ones I tend to use sometimes. I, I prefer nortriptyline though. Nortriptyline is one of my go-tos if I want to use tricyclic. All right. It's better tolerated, less side effects. Any questions? No. Should we um know the uh, doses, like the starting no, dose? No, 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 the doses. No. Just know the 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 pharmacodynamics of the medications and some of the pharmacokinetics. Dosage, it's okay. You don't have to know that. Any questions? No. Okay. Side effects of antidepressants, all right? The most common side effect that people complain about that we should be screening for regularly is sexual dysfunction, all right? So you should be asking patients, you know, it's funny, psychiatry is the only is the only profession where you can ask someone how their sex life is and how much money they make without anyone complaining, right? How much money do you make? Because I wanna know, are you able to pay your bills, right? Are you able to pay your rent? I also wanna know, are you manic? Are you making impulsive decisions, right? What are, Obviously, you want to find a way to ask it without being too judgment, judgmental and not stigmatizing, but you ask them about the sexual dysfunction. Ask them about the sexual functioning. I'm sorry. You know, how is your sex drive now? Why are you asking? Well, because the meds can impair it. So I want to know what your baseline functioning is now so that, you know, if when you take the medication, I'll know if your meds are affecting it, right? If someone already has low sex drive and low libido before the medication, maybe it's not the medication causing it, right? Or maybe it's a depression that hasn't been treated. You know, you have to kind of figure things out. GI side effects. All right, a lot of our serotonin are actually in the microfilm cells of our stomach, all right? So that's why a lot of the side effects are serotonin. So people might have, uh, I'm sorry, GI side effects from serotonin. You see nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Sertraline uh, is notorious for that. So patients who are on sertraline try to go slower because they might be prone to GI side effects. Usually I'll tell them to take it with food, all right? So take the sertraline with food, it'll help with absorption and you'll have less side effects, all right? Possible trigger triggering of mania, all right? So be careful of the family history of mania. And a lot of times this happens with primary care doctors because a lot of primary care docs will just give SSRIs because it's pretty easy to prescribe. But what you risk is if you don't do a good screening and they have a family history of mania and you, and you induce a hypomanic or a mixed episode, it's very hard to treat that. And during a mixed episode, they're actually higher risk of suicide, right? A mixed episode could be someone who's depressed, right? Uh, is still suicidal, but now you give them the insomnia and the energy of bipolar disorder, right? So imagine they're up all night now and they're still depressed. What are they going to do with themselves? They're a higher likelihood of killing themselves, right? That's a mixed episode. Be careful with combining with anticoagulants because serotonin can also uh, or is also needed for clotting, all right? It can affect clotting, I'm sorry. So there could be bleeding risk. So sometimes up to the surgeon, I've had some patients get surgery and the surgeon actually stopped SSRIs like a week before the surgery. All right, because they can affect bleeding also, depending on how serious the surgery is. All right. For SNRIs, it can cause something called antidepressant induced liver injury. All right. Um, be careful and make sure you check ALT, AST regularly. All right. I would probably check at least once or twice a year. People on SNRI. So that would be your effectors, your duloxetine, your prestique. All right. Those are the most common SNRIs. DNRI, anyone know what DNRI stands for? Dopamine, norepinephrine, after. What's an example of a DNRI? Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin, right? It lowers the seizure threshold. So be careful with patients who drink heavy alcohol, history of seizure disorder, right? Uh, history of eating disorder, right? Patients who are purging, they're going to have electrolyte imbalances. So if you give them Wellbutrin, there's a high risk of them developing a seizure, all right? This can happen too, and I've seen this as well, right? You guys know Wellbutrin is used off-label for ADHD, right? Because it's dopaminergic. Be careful of patients who have absence seizures. So what is an absence seizure? Absence is, an, is a non-tonic-clonic seizure. So what will happen is a patient might stare out, and the teachers might tell the parents, I think your kid has ADHD. Why? Because they're staring out into the room and they're not focusing, all right? They're actually having a seizure. If you give them Wellbutrin, because you're using Wellbutrin off-label, quote-unquote, to help with ADHD, which you think is ADHD, your absence seizure is going to get worse. You're inducing a seizure even more, and they're actually going to get even much worse. 
So be careful with that, all right? You might refer them to neurology. Ask the teacher, are they staring out into space? You know, and see, because sometimes when they, and they, and the important thing is they'll forget what happened. The kid will say, well, I don't know. I don't know what happened. It's almost like, because when you're having a seizure, you're not aware of what's happening. They almost, sometimes they might even be confused. They don't, they don't, they don't know their home. They might be confused for a couple of seconds. They might know who the teacher is. They might know who their family member is. But once you see those red flags, refer them to neurology to rule out a seizure, right? Remember, a lot of our psych meds lower the seizure threshold, all right? So you don't want to induce a seizure uh, with a patient who has, you know, possible underlying seizure disorder, okay? Like I said, tricyclics. Anticholinergic, all right, decup, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, blurred vision, decup, D C U B, dry mouth, uh, constipation, urinary retention, and blurred vision, all right? Antihistamine, weight gain, sleep, makes you drowsy, all right? Long term antihistamine use will actually cause you to gain weight. Alpha blockade, all right? Orthostatic hypotension, that's very important. You ask a patient, Make sure you change positions very slowly because you might get dizzy and I don't want you to collapse, all right? Be careful with hot showers. I had a patient who was on prazosin, all right? And that's an alpha blocker. So what happens? When your body normally changes position, your brain will release norepinephrine, right? Because when your body releases norepinephrine, it tells your peripheral vessels to actually increase blood pressure and increase your pulse, right? What happens when you're blocking that response? When you change position, you're blocking those receptors. Your body doesn't know to increase your blood pressure. And what happens? You don't get enough blood pressure in your brain and people will collapse, all right? The reason I'm making these examples is I want you to understand why the meds work and just have general understanding of how medicine and psychiatry work together because you might have to troubleshoot some of these side effects, all right? Uh, secondary amines are the nortriptyline and the cipramine. Like I mentioned, they tend to be, you know, less antihistamine, less anticholinergic, better tolerated, all right? Tertiary amines tend to have more anticholinergic, more antihistamine, doxepine, imipramine, uh, amitriptyline, so they tend to have more side effects. All right. Bipolar disorder. All right. So this is how this is the mnemonic I use for mania. A lot of people use it. All right. So D, they're distractible. Uh, you know, it almost like they have ADHD symptoms. Right. They can't focus. They're irritable. Every little thing makes them, you know, angry. They're responsible, right? They're not, they're not paying the rent on time because they're gambling or, or you're spending money on other things. They're grandiose. So kids can have grandiosity also, but it's a little bit different. I work in child psych and adult psych, so I see grandiosity both ways. A kid who has grandiosity might tell you, I'm not focusing in class because I know more than the teacher, right? I'm smarter than the teacher. I'm smarter than all the other kids in my class, right? Someone who's grandiose, who's not a kid, might feel like, I'm the best before on my job. I don't know why they're not giving me a raise already. You know, if I left this job right now, the whole company would fall apart. All right. That would be grandiosity for uh, when it's an adult. All right. A kid, it would be more based on their age. Flights of ideas. Speaking fast, having many ideas in their, in their mind. Right. They might talk about what they bought at the mall and all of a sudden go into, you know, how great they are. Going from one idea to another. And you can't just, you can't interrupt them. You try to interrupt them, and they keep talking. It's almost like word diarrhea. All right. Increase activity. All right. This is important. I might ask if I'm working in child psych. I might ask the parent, "Have you noticed your kid being up all night?" Yes. Okay. What are they doing? Well, they're on the computer researching something. Okay. I'm curious. When you try to tell them to go back to sleep, or you distract, or you try to interrupt them from doing what they're doing, what do they do? They get really mad at me. They might throw something, curse me out. So usually in mania or hypomania, they'll have an increase in activity and goal-directed behavior. So they're not sleeping and they're doing something, cleaning the room, reorganizing the room all night, right? Moving the desk or doing stuff, shopping. But anytime you try to stop them from doing the goal-directed behavior, they get very agitated. So that's a good differential there, right? Do they get mad when you try to distract them, all right? Sleep decrease would increase energy. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask patients, have you ever been, have you ever gone a day without sleeping? Yes, okay, are you tired the next day? Yes, I take naps, okay, it might not be mania. Have you ever gone two or three days without sleeping? Yes. Are you tired? No, I just keep going. I'm still productive. All right, that might be mania. All right, so make sure you tease that out. Talkative, they talk a lot, all right? Pressured speech, you can't interrupt them, talking very quickly. Any questions with that? Like I said, this isn't really a diagnosing class, but just to give you guys an idea of what mania looks like, we're gonna explore this again as you guys move up in your career, but this is just a good example of it. These are FDA approved medications, bipolar. All right. Since when you work in child psych, 70 to 80% of your meds will probably be off label. Since I work in child psych, I prescribe a lot of meds off label. 
off label or with evidence, right? Just because something is FDA approved doesn't necessarily mean it's the best treatment for your patients, right? Just keep that in mind. But since this is a this is you know academia and this is a course that I have to teach you guys uh, appropriately, we're only going to go by FDA approved medications. So none of your test questions will be on off label usage for medications, right? I'll, I'll say that again. None of your test questions will be off label medications, right? Everything will have to be FDA approved. Valproic acid, all right, is FDA approved for bipolar mania. So if someone has a dig fast symptoms, that would be an appropriate treatment, all right? It is used off label for bipolar depression. You will see that if you Google it and you'll see some doctors do prescribe it if you guys are practicing as RNs by now for bipolar depression, but it is not approved for bipolar depression. For whatever reason, when they did the FDA testing and they tried to market it, Depakote Valproic acid for bipolar depression, it failed the study, all right? Not enough patients responded. It didn't separate from placebo. So therefore, I didn't get that indication, all right? Same for maintenance. Lithium. Lithium is used a lot for bipolar depression, and I use it for bipolar depression. But again, for test, test sake, it is only FDA approved for bipolar mania. And maintenance, I'm sorry. Not for depression, all right? Lamotrigine is only FDA approved for, for maintenance. Carbamazepine is only approved for bipolar mania, all right? Going back. Depakote. The important thing to know about Depakote is it is neurotoxic and should not be used in women of childbearing age. All right. So be careful with women who are stable on Depakote. Make sure you you counsel them or at least you document that you doc that you counsel them on birth control. All right. I usually don't prescribe Depakote to women of childbearing age unless they're on birth control. All right. Whether they have an IUD or you know they're taking the oral contraceptives and they're aware that if they get pregnant on Depakote. You know, there's a high risk of spina bifida and a lot of other, uh, you know, disorders with their kid, all right? There's also risk of autism, a risk of intellectual disability. There's a, really a lot, all right? So, so valproic acid, all right, also called trade name Depakote, comes in different forms. You have the liquid form, all right? The thing about the liquid form is that it's absorbed in your stomach. Since absorbed in your stomach, people tend to have more GI side effects from that, all right? There's also Depakote DR, which is called delayed release, which is absorbed in your small intestine. So what happens is it's coated with a specific layer that doesn't get absorbed until it passes your stomach and it goes into your small intestine. That's important because patients who are prone to GI side effects, acid reflux, you might give them Depakote DR, delayed release, to help them take the medication so that you know it, it doesn't go through the stomach, all right? In the hospital, they tend to use you know the liquid form because patients don't to cheat the medications. All right, so you give them the liquid form so that you know they're actually taking it. All right. Depakote is also very highly protein bound. So be careful with patients who have hypoalbuminuria, they have low albumin. All right. Since the Depakote that works in your brain that passes by the brain barrier is only the active Depakote that's not bound to protein. If someone has low protein, there's not going to be enough Depakote to bind to that protein. Therefore, you'll have a higher free valproic acid level, which means they're going to be higher risk of toxicity. All right. So a good example would be a patient who's stable on, I don't know, 1500 milligrams of Depakote inpatient hospital, right? And they're homeless. They get discharged from the hospital, but now they're homeless. They don't have access to regular meals all the time. All right. They're not able to eat for a couple of days. The albumin tends to drop and now they start developing Depakote toxicity or valproic acid toxicity. Why is that? Because their albumin drops because they're not eating. They're not getting regular nutrition and they have more free Depakote. That's going to go up. All right. That's important. So be careful eating disorders as well. Be careful with Depakote with eating disorders. Anything that affects protein albumin can increase your Depakote level, okay? Childbearing age, dangerous, all right? Don't use it for any first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. Depakote is a big no-no, all right? Sometimes if the patient is a very risk of aggression as if you're trying to kill themselves and Depakote is the only medicine that's worked, you might have to have the difficult conversation of risk benefits because not everyone who's on Depakote will have, you know, risk of abnormalities to their fetus. But you would argue that if they weren't on Depakote, they might hurt themselves and kill the baby. That with a comfortable OBGYN and constant monitoring, you might be able to uh, put them on Depakote. But again, that would be very high risk. A lot of times they'll load them up with folic acid, right? Because Depakote eats up and lowers fol folate. So they load them up in folic acid. All right. Depakote is a histone deacetylase inhibitor. If you guys don't know what histone deacetylase is, HDAC inhibitor, it's a class of medications that we also use in chemotherapy. The reason why I'm bringing that up is because histone deacetylase is needed for cell division, 
All right, if you stop that, what happens? Your cells are not dividing, therefore people will have really bad side effects, right? You need cells to divide when you're pregnant, right? That's how the organs are being formed. So if you're giving someone Depakote and you're impairing cell division, that's when babies come out without organs, you know, they might have spina bifida, so it's very dangerous, all right? So just know that because of that mechanism, Depakote can cause that. It also can suppress bone marrow. So there might be, you know, low platelets, low white blood cell, low red blood cell count. Be careful with that also. So I would do a CBC pretty regularly with patients with Depakote. Depakote level, CBC, making sure there's adequate nutrition, and obviously regular labs, right? Normal Depakote level is usually 80 to 120 nanograms per ml, 80 to 120. As low as 80, as high as 120, in between that sweet spot. Any questions with Depakote? No, okay. Lithium. Lithium, all right, is one of the only medicines in psychiatry in mood disorders that have shown to reduce suicide and homicidality, all right? There's actually some studies that show that there's natural lithium in our drinking water. So the states that have less lithium actually in the drinking water have higher rates of suicide, higher rates of homicidality, right? There's something in lithium that for, for whatever reason helps reduce suicide and helps with aggression, all right? There's a lot of hypotheses, but you know, I don't want to touch too much about that because I want to, you know, there's a lot of stuff to cover, but so lithium works in many things. It works in serotonin, right? It downregulates 5-HT1A at the, at the raphe nuclei. All right, raphe nuclei is, in the, is the major cell body that produces serotonin, all right? So if it downregulates that other receptor, the raphe nuclei is free to increase serotonin, all right? So there is a, a warning that if you give someone lithium on top of an SSRI, there could be a theoretical risk of serotonin. I've never, I've never seen it, but make sure you, you tell the patients. I use it pretty regularly. I prescribe lithium augmentation to patients who have treatment-resistant depression with SSRIs with good effect, especially patients who have past history of suicide. I use low-dose lithium, all right? Lithium also has neuroprotective factors, all right? So what it does is it, it, it impedes apoptosis, all right? Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So it, it stops cell death, so therefore it increases the connections. All right, so serotonergic, it stops apoptosis. It might increase some growth factors, all right? It's anti-suicidal, right? Lithium levels normally are 0. 0.6 to 1.2. If you want a quick way to remember levels of all these medications, all right, this is for Depakote, Lithium, and Carbamazepine. Half a dozen to a dozen, all right? Six to 12. Depakote, like, even though I said 80 to 120, if you just remember it, 60 to 120, right, that would be Depakote. Lithium, 0. 0.6 to 1.2. Carbamazepine, 6 to 12. If you know half a dozen to a dozen, you can kind of, you know, estimate what, what the regular labs are. All right, any questions with that? No. Lithium in the first trimester can cause something called Epstein's anomaly. Epstein's anomaly is a is a uh, disorder that causes your your uh, your uh, tricuspid valve to be implanted lower, right? So it's a cardiac problem. So if you can remember LIT for lithium, low implanted tricuspid valve, it's called Epstein's anomaly, and that usually happens if you use lithium in the first trimester of pregnancy, all right? Because it's during that first trimester that the heart is being made. The reason why that's important because sometimes patients who do very well on lithium, if you have a comfortable OBGYN, I've had patients I kept on lithium during the first trimester, all right, but you have to coordinate with an OBGYN. But the second and third trimesters, the heart is already formed. Lithium could be a safe option for, for women of childbearing age who have a history of suicide. All right, lithium, before you start lithium, you need to check thyroid functioning because lithium can cause hypo, low thyroid. Make sure you check kidney functioning, right? Because, you know, lithium is excreted through your kidneys. So if you have a low GFR, you, you have a higher risk of lithium toxicity. And also lithium can affect calcium levels, all right? What affects calcium regulation in the body? Do you guys know? What organs affect calcium regulation in the body? There's two main organs. Parathyroid. Oh. Yep, very good. Parathyroid, that's one. And what's the other one? Kidneys, all right? So parathyroid and your kidneys are regulate calcium levels. When you give someone lithium long-term, it actually affects your calcium sensing receptors in your parathyroid gland and your kidneys. And what happens is if your, receptor, if your, if your receptors are not working correctly, right? Lithium will, will trick your body into thinking that calcium levels are low. So it'll cause your PTH to actually increase and it'll cause your kidneys to reabsorb calcium. So that can cause hypercalcemia, right? Hypercalcemia long-term can cause 
psychiatric symptoms, right? Can cause stones, renal stones, can cause bone issues, right? Can cause pain. So, you know, sometimes patients who have hypercalcemia on long-term lithium and they start having depression or start having anxiety, but they're still taking the SSRI that you're prescribing them. I would probably check calcium levels. If their calcium is elevated, I would refer them to their primary care doctor and see. Because sometimes with a hyperactive PTH, they can laser it. And especially if lithium is the only medication that's working, they'll have to address that, all right? And you'll have to work closely with them. Any questions with that? So lithium, make sure you do a baseline thyroid test, T TSH, right? Do um, BUN creatinine and GFR to check kidney functioning, all right? And do a calcium level. Important thing to know about calcium, calcium is also affected by albumin. So you have to correct it. It's a pretty, there's a formula online. If someone has hypoalbuminuria, there's a formula to correct it. So you, you put the calcium that came out during the Chem 20 and you correct it with what the dose of their albumin is to get the, the accurate calcium level, right? Because it's not going to give you the, the function of calcium. You could do um, an ionized calcium, but it has to be on ice and to do it outpatient is not really practical. So do a regular calcium and just correct it with that formula I told you, correct the calcium, all right? What are we up to? Carbamazepine. Carbamazepine is a proof of bipolar mania. I don't like to use carbamazepine a lot only because it's a very strong inducer and it kind of messes up the regimen of your patients. So it's a pan inducer, which means it induces almost all of this of enzyme. So if someone's stable on specific dose of medications, once you give them carbamazepine, you'll probably have to adjust their other medications to account for the carbamazepine. Plus the carbamazepine induces its own metabolism. So you might have to increase carbamazepine after 10 days because it's gonna induce its own metabolism. That makes any sense. So normally you do carbamazepine level seven to 10 days after you start the medication, all right? Carbamazepine also suppresses your bone marrow. So they have a higher risk of developing red, low red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelets. So be careful if you have someone on carbamazepine and Depakote or carbamazepine and clozapine, all right? Because any meds that have the same side effect profile, you can double the risk of that side effect, all right? So just know that carbamazepine is a pan inducer. That's important to know, all right? So you have to do the blood levels seven to 10 days after you start it. And then you have to adjust the medications also accordingly because it might mess up your regimen. Carbamazepine, carbamazepine can also cause hyponatremia. So make sure you check sodium levels, all right? Hyponatremia can sometimes cause Confusion, ataxia, long-term hyponatremia can cause seizures. So be careful. So hyponatremia could, could also happen when patients who are on carbamazepine and SSRIs, because SSRIs can also cause hyponatremia. All right. There's something called symptom and inappropriate ADH. Your body oversecretes ADH. And what's ADH? Antidiuretic hormone, right? So you retain water. So what happens when you flood your cells with water? Sodium goes down. So they're drinking a lot. They don't have, they have too much ADH. They're flooding their cells with water. Sodium is going to go down and they can have a seizure. So be careful with that. All right. Olanzapine. Olanzapine is an atypical antipsychotic and we do use it for maintenance and we do use it for bipolar mania. All right. They use that a lot in patient hospital because it works pretty quickly. It works faster than a mood stabilizer. No other thing about olanzapine is that it's very metabolically, you know, toxic to a patient, which means that it'll put them at risk for developing diabetes if they don't follow a healthy diet and exercise. It also puts them at risk for weight gain, all right? Usually I'll check um, lipid panel and I'll check triglycerides. So triglycerides elevated, well, you'll know because that's, that's also a, like a cheap test to indicate insulin sensitivity, right? As triglycerides go, triglycerides go up, your sensitivity to insulin tends to go down, all right? And that puts people at risk for type two diabetes. So be careful about that, all right? Olanzapine, um, you know, I, sometimes I'll start them with metformin prophylactically, all right? And I also educate them on healthy diet and exercise. I'll touch more on the lens when we talk about antipsychotics for schizophrenia, but that's what you need to know. Bipolar mania, all right? A lens between fluoxetine combination, even though I told you guys SSRIs are a big no-no for patients on bipolarity, the only exception is when you combine fluoxetine with a it is It is combined and it's evidence-based for bipolar depression. And the trade name is called Symbiax, S-Y-M-B-I-A-X, a lansbine fluoxetine combination, all right? So a lansbine by itself is FDA approved bipolar mania, a lansbine with fluoxetine is approved for bipolar depression, all right? Remember, fluoxetine is an inhibitor, 
So if you give someone Symbiax, be, be aware that the fluoxetine added to the olanzapine can affect other medications because the fluoxetine is there, all right? Risperidone is another atypical antipsychotic that's used by polar mania. The benefits of risperidone, it comes in injectable form, right? You have there's so many now, there's like five of them. There's Perseris, which is uh, subcutaneous. You have Invega Sistena, which is the metabolite of risperidone, which is IM. But just know that risperidone, the advantage of that for mania is that it comes in injectables, all right? I'll talk more about all the atypicals when we talk about schizophrenia and antipsychotics. Quetiapine, the good thing about quetiapine is it covers all three, right? There's not many ma medications that cover all three. It's FDA approved by bipolar mania, it's FDA approved by bipolar depression, and FDA approved for maintenance. So if a patient comes to you and says, you know, I only want to take one medication, quetiapine might be a good option for them, right? You might have to adjust it accordingly, but it's a one med that covers all three. But again, quetiapine is metabolically toxic to a patient too, right? It can cause metabolic syndrome. The reason why that is similar to olanzapine because it's a 5-H2C, 5-HT2C antagonist and a very strong antihistamine. If you see a medication that has both of those properties, that, that usually means there's, there's more um, issues of weight gain with those medications, all right? Or insulin resistance. Because high olanzapine, notorious for that. Zeprazidone, geodon, all right? Thing to know about geodon, it's approved for bipolar mania, but be careful because geodon can affect uh, QTC, Right, QTC is your heart rate, your your uh, rhythm of your heart. Um, so it can cause prolonged QTC. So if someone's in, on Zeprazidone, it would probably be smart to do regular EKGs with them. Especially if they're getting IM. I know in the hospital they do Zeprazidone IM. You would probably have to do EKG with them. All right. Aripiprazole, Abilify, another advantage. It does come along, I think, also. All right. It tends to cause less weight gain in patients, but I, I do see it causing weight gain in, in quite a few of them. But... In a test question, they usually say it's, it's less metabolically uh, toxic to patients. And the centipede, uh, it's used for mania. The good thing about a centipede is it comes in a patch form. It's the only antipsychotic that comes in a patch. I've never used it. I mean, I don't, I don't know why there would be an advantage to, to a patch form of medication, but that's really the only difference with it. All right. Any questions? Pretty heavy topic, but you can always ask me. Uh, what about lamotrigine? Oh yeah, sorry, lamotrigine. Yes, thank you. It's very important. So lamotrigine is um is only approved for maintenance, but we do use it for depression. The thing that you should know about lamotrigine is it causes um something called Stevens Johnson syndrome. All right, the risk is about one out of three thousand patients. The risk of Stevens Johnson is one out of three thousand, but the risk of benign macropapular rash is ten percent. So out of the ten people that come into your office that you prescribe lamotrigine, ten percent, uh, or one one out of ten will develop a rash. All right, so usually. If it's a rash that's not on the neck area, it's not on the mucosa, not on the mouth, not on the lips, um, it's not accompanied by a fever, not accompanied by joint pain, um, it doesn't have regular borders, it's probably just a regular micropopular rash, but I would probably still send them to, to their urgent care or primary care doctor to take a look at it, especially if it started around the same time that they started the Lamotrigine, all right? Lamotrigine has to be titrated pretty specifically. It usually starts 25 milligrams for two weeks, right? Then 50 milligrams for two weeks, then 100 milligrams for a month. And every time uh, you see them, you need to tell them, you know, are you checking your body for a rash? And you can also look, because sometimes patients who are obese, they might not see their back. So make sure you check to see if there's any rashes there, all right? I usually advise patients to um, not start new detergents during that same time, because remember, if they start new detergent, they can be prone for, for different skin lesions also. So you want to make sure it's actually, you know, the Lamotrigine, not that, all right? Uh, if someone's on Depakote and you want to start Lamotrigine, you want to start, this is important too, you want to start Lamotrigine at half the dose, all right? Because Depakote interferes with Lamotrigine's metabolism. So if someone's on Depakote, and sometimes we do add Lamotrigine to cover both sides, right? Because, because Depakote is for bipolar mania, and Lamotrigine might cover maintenance, you have to start Lamotrigine at half. So it would be probably 12.5 for two weeks, and then 25 for two weeks, and go very slowly with the addition. When would you be like in the clear as far as a rash with like Lamotrigine? Like, is it really you're just checking every time you up the dose or? Yeah, like so the, yeah, okay. so the risk of rash is usually early on in treatment. All right, because Stevens Johnson tends to be an autoimmune, autoimmune response. So if patients, you know, not used to the medication, it tells your body to kind of attacks itself. So usually, you know, if, they're, if they've been stable for a couple of years and they're taking it consistently, then yeah, the risk does go low, but it's never zero, all right? But I also tell patients if they miss more than five doses, which is like a week or five days, 
you have to restart the titration. So if a patient is stable at 150 milligrams of motrogen, right? Because they go on vacation and they forget to take it with them and they come back, they technically have to restart the titration from 25 again. What I usually do is I give them a, a written script for a 25 milligram dose for two weeks, just in case, because if they lose it, they'll have that restart again, just in case. Because if patients don't do that, the risk of Steven Johnson is very high. All right, you don't want that to happen. So make sure you educate them about that. Once you, if you miss more than five days, please let me know. I'll send a new script for 25 or hold on to this paper script because you'll always have, you know, the starting dose for two weeks again if you start it. All right, obviously if they're on Depakote, you know, that's higher risk if they're taking Depakote but they forget the Lamotrigine, but you have to give them a 12.5. Uh, for two weeks instead of a 25. All right. Any questions? I'm going to sit on, I'm going to sit here for two minutes and let you guys digest it and ask me a question because this is a pretty heavy, heavy slide. Which of these medications would treat um, a mixed episode? That's a good question. Uh, usually with mixed episodes, you, you use a lot of polypharmacy because it's very difficult to treat. So sometimes monotherapy for a mixed episode is, is not going to happen. Yeah. So, Usually for a mixed episode, if the mixed episode is predominantly mania, I would probably lean on Depakote combined with Olanzapine. If the mixed episode is predominantly depression, right, uh, and not a lot of manic symptoms, I would probably like to use Lamotrigine and Lithium. But that's anecdotal. That's I'm just telling you my practice. But when it comes to evidence base, if you look it up, mixed episodes don't really have many guidelines. Yeah, very difficult to treat, which is why you don't want to give patients SSRIs. Because once you once once they cycle to a mixed episode, you're chasing so many symptoms, it's very hard to treat. And it's almost like their illness changes. So if someone, before they put an SSRI, they have clear cut, usually depressions and mania, right? They'll know, well, I'm usually manic for two months and I'm depressed for three weeks. Someone puts them on SSRI because they catch them at that time with a depression, they complain about depression. Now, all of a sudden, they're rapid cycling, right? Which is where that means they're, they're cycling very quickly and they're having mixed episodes. Those are both very hard to treat. Rapid cyclers, which have like no clear distinction of when their episodes are gonna end, mixed with many symptoms. Those patients usually are on like four or five medications, unfortunately. So model, uh, you know, the story is do not give them SSRIs and, and try to catch it early if you can. And it's the sad part is, usually it takes 10 years for, for patients to get an accurate diagnosis of bipolar. These are the patients you see, they've been in every SSRI, they've been to many specialists, and for whatever reason, their manic episodes were either underreported or missed. And now they're rapid cycling in the your office, right? Do we move on? Um, question. So does um, Zyprestidone and Aripiprazole, um, they both cause the least um, me metabolic issues. Is it one or the other or both of them? Zeprazidone is the least. So the prazidone, yeah, because the prazidone is not an antihistamine and not a 5-ECTC antagonist. It has the least amount of metabolic burden. Yeah. Abilify is a little bit. So there is some metabolic. And kids tend to have more weight gain on Abilify than adults. So in child psychiatry, I do see a lot of weight gain with Abilify. Yeah. And adults, not as much. But Zeprazidone, so Zeprazidone, and even though it's not on here, Latuda, Lorazidone are the most metabolic and neutral medications. I have a question. Do we only check for that HLA-B allele in carbamazepine? Yes, good question. Wow, extra credit for you. I, I should have brought that important. Yes, only carbamazepine, yeah. I'll tell you the mnemonic. HLA-B1502, no carbamazepine for you. HLA-B1502, HLA no carbamazepine for you. So that means that if you do the genetic testing and they're positive for that gene, unless you don't like the person, then you prescribe them carbamazepine, all right? But if you want to keep your license, you don't prescribe them carbamazepine. And we only test it if they have Asian ancestry? Yes, Asian ancestry, yeah. But I would also test if they have, you know, a lot of people are mixed now, you know? So if they have a little bit, you're not sure, I would just check for it. You know? huh. Good question. Sorry, I forgot about that. That's important. I'm sorry, there's so much material that, like, I can't regurgitate everything that's in the book, so I expect you guys to read it and just ask me, all right? I know it's a lot of material, but you can do it. I did it. A lot of other MPs have done it, so it's possible. Don't worry. Your brain is going gonna, is gonna to hypertrophy from all this. You're going to thank me later on. Right. Mechanisms of mood stabilizers. All right. So Depakote. MOA stands for mechanism of action, right? It works on voltage-sensitive sodium channels. So 
what happens is when sodium channels are not opening up, you're not having a action potential, right? So remember, you have negative uh, membrane potential, which is negative 70 millivolts, right? And once it's negative 55, that triggers a high, uh, an action potential, right? Which keeps going until you hit what? Positive 30 millivolts, and then it goes back down, right? Uh, so Depakote stops that, so you don't have a high, so you don't have an action potential. Therefore, like I mentioned, there's a relationship between seizures and mood disorders. So you know, if you stop seizures, you stop cycling for mood disorders also. All right, enhances GABA. So GABA is inhibitory. So by increasing GABA, you also you know bring down the action potential and also stop the reuptake of your. Uh, you also stop the secretion of your monoamines. Right, so blocks reuptake, breakdown of GABA. Um, but Depakote is contraindicated in pregnancy, all right? Carbamazepine also works on channels, voltage-sensitive sodium channels. Okay, calcium is important because if you don't have calcium influx into your cell, it doesn't cause excretion. So if you block calcium, it stops that, that neuron from actually firing the neurotransmitter. So whenever you give meds for calcium, calcium blockers, kind of like a Kepra, Kepra box calcium, uh, calcium channels also, it helps with seizures, all right? Potassium channels and access GABA. So therefore, whenever you increase GABA, it tends to work in anxiety and works in mania. All right. If you look at Depakote, enhances GABA, carbamazepine enhances GABA, therefore both work in mania, right? Now, now look at lamotrigine. Works on sodium channels, works in calcium, potassium. Doesn't work on GABA, it reduces glutamate instead. Right? It doesn't work in GABA. I'll emphasize that again. Lamotrigine doesn't work in GABA, therefore it doesn't work in mania. All right. Valproate and carbamazepine increases GABA, works on GABA, therefore it helps with mania, all right? Lamotrigine blocks glutamate, doesn't increase GABA, therefore only works in depression. Not FDA approved for depression, but is FDA approved for maintenance, all right? Teach about Stevens-Johnson syndrome, all right? Tell your patients to check their skin for a rash. Any questions? Oh, there you go. HLAB1502 and all Asian ancestry. I knew I was getting to it. All right, that's all she wrote. Now let's spend a half hour talking about what's not clear or I can repeat things again. I mean, it's a pretty heavy topic, so. This you know. might sound like a strange question, but why is Lamotrigine only approved for maintenance if it doesn't, like FDA doesn't say it treats either mania or depression? Like, does that make sense? Yeah, I know the answer to that. Like maintaining what? No, <laughs> like I don't know what so when the company that made Lamotrigine came to the FDA and they wanted to do the study to test it, they, they had a failed study. A failed study means that it wasn't a negative study. A failed study means that the medication didn't separate from placebo. And the reason why that happened was they recruited patients, they recruited a population that only had mild to moderate depressive symptoms. So what happens when you give someone medication that was mild to moderate? The placebo response tends to be higher, right? When we prescribe Lamotrigine for bipolar depression, they tend to have higher moderate to severe symptoms. So when you give someone a medication for moderate to severe, that separates from placebo much higher. So therefore it was a failed study when they marketed it. And by the time they tried to do the study again, it was already generic. So there was no money involved. So that's the answer. So in clinical practice, it's evidence-based. There's lots of studies out there that show that if you look at uh, the CanMet guidelines, the Florida guidelines for mood disorders, Lamotrigine is up there for bipolar depression. Because number one, it doesn't cause weight gain. It doesn't cause sexual dysfunction. It doesn't cause sedation, right? I mean, besides your skin falling off in the first month, it's not a bad medication. But, you know, it's evidence-based and it works. So your test is next week. So please study. You know, it's going to be a lot on the mood stabilizers, a lot on the mechanisms of action. Sip enzymes. You should be watching my YouTube videos on Rewind over and over again, sleeping with them. The exam is 50 questions, right? Yes. And how long do we have? Uh, I believe you have one hour, but it's going to be open for 48 hours because I know it conflicts with some of you students have um, the other test, so we open it for 48 hours. Please don't take it on 11.59 uh, p.m. and it closes at 12 a.m. unless you're feeling very brave and Confident in your ability. Give yourself some time. Take it in the morning. After breakfast, possibly. That's possible. You're most alert, actually, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Unless you work overnight shift, but 
Most people, their circadian rhythm, they're, you're most alert in the morning. Then as from 2 p.m. down, your cognition tends to go down. So don't take it after work. Take it on a day that you're off and relax. And I want you guys to do well because if you guys do bad, that's that's uh, that means I'm a bad professor. So I know I'm a great professor. So I expect you all to, to study and do very well on it. So I don't fail. Like I said, I don't fail anybody. You all fail yourself. So if you guys fail, it's not it's not me because I'm giving you guys all the material, right? But I don't think you guys are going to do bad. No pressure. For the link to the SIP chart, it's not at least for me, when I press it, it doesn't work. If I look up just like Flockhart table, is it universal? Yes, the Flockhart table is universal. I think that when Professor Smith had linked it, that website <laughs> probably no longer working because it's just a link to a website. So if you guys just want to look up Flockhart table, you could just, it's universal. It's the same table all around. Should we know anything specific with regards to like the star D or the MDQ or just kind of what they're for or? Um, I don't want to reveal too much, but for star D, no. So you tell me, what about the star D? What, what, what was your interpretation? Did you read it? Yeah, I checked it out. Okay. So this, can you summarize it for me? Like, what did you infer from that? Like reading that study, like what did you learn from it? No, I was just looking at it. Just, it was a, de a depression screening, correct? <clears throat> no, no, Star D is not. No, Star D is a is a seminal study that had a large population of people in clinics. And what Star D trial said. It's good that you asked me because I can clarify. The reason why Star D is important is because it teaches us that number one, if you don't treat depression and diagnose it early, that the outcomes get worse. So based on the Star D trials, only thirty percent of the patients that were in that study had full remission on the first medication that you took. All right, as they so imagine if you fail them. So I, I believe the, the medication was citalopram was the first medication they were on. Depending on if they if they responded to that or not, they had an option. There was some got put on Wellbutrin, some got put on thyroid hormones, some got put on lithium. And just to kind of summarize it, each time they failed uh, a specific adjunct or switch, they tended to respond less and less, right? So the key to that study is that not everyone responds in the first trial of antidepressants, right? Only one third or 33% responded. Uh, adjunct tends to be better than switching. So the patients who are added medications, say they had comorb they had adjunct Wellbutrin or switched to Wellbutrin, they tended to do better, right? And uh, you know that was that was the main thing. Thank you. The patient who didn't respond early on, right? The patients who were the thirty three percent that responded early on had less likelihood of remission later on. So they actually the remission was like maybe further down the road. The patients who responded on the third arm of the study, right? They failed on two and they respond to the third arm, whether, whether it was adding lithium or adding thyroid hormone, they tended to have, you know, reemergence of symptoms sooner, some within a few months. So that shows us that we need better treatments for depression. So if you were lucky and you had one third respond, you were one of that one third or 33% that responded very well, you tended to not have depression much longer. Your maintenance phase was much longer. Those who responded on the third arm or later on, they, they relapse much quicker. All right. Thank you. MDQ stands for mood disorders questionnaire. So the that's just a questionnaire to assess for mood. Oh, symptoms. I think that's what I was thinking of. With yeah, the, yeah. Uh, HQ7 <laughs> is for depression, GAD7, even though we're not talking about anxiety now, is for anxiety. So, you know. So some of the, we, we use Vanderbilt's, Hamilton depression scale, <clears throat> HQ9. These are just some. I, I don't expect you guys to memorize the scales. I'm not going to say someone has this on this scale, what is there, whatever. I'm not going to do that. Let's have a general idea of what the scales are, what they're for. I told you I told you that after like this week, everything just kind of compounds. So if you don't keep up with your reading, the material gets really intense. So mood disorders is one of the most like heavy materials. And we start talking about psychosis, ADHD. So it, it keeps building up. So you have to really understand the basics, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics to really understand the mechanisms of uh, the depressant meant, right? Antidepressants, I mean.
So I was supposed to end class at 1230, but since you guys have an exam, I'll go to 1245. So if you guys have any other questions, you know, I'll stay for another 15 minutes. Please ask or, you know, if you're not sure, think about it. Just ask. There's no stupid questions. Just one question on the textbook readings. Um, so I think stall, especially the stall, had more diverse medications uh, that they were presenting. Um, and I think during the lecture, we covered uh, much less volume in terms of, let's say, like medications that we talked about. Are we still expected to know and cover all those um, yeah. medications that were talked about in stalls? You are. Yeah. Um, that's, that's that's the thing. I can't read the book to you. And there's so much material to cover that I'm just doing a general outline, but the test is on everything. But if you're not, if there's anything in style that was, that you read that wasn't clear, I can clarify for you right now. Psych ain't easy. Right? I thought it was going to be easy, but it's not. Should we focus more on this lecture's material as opposed to like last lecture for the exam? Unfortunately, um, everything is covered. So my, my lecture is kind of just like based on what questions you guys ask me and the general idea. So if you focus just on my lectures, it might not be enough to pass the exam. I'm just being honest with you. So you have to actually dig down and, and really read the material too, because there's going to be a decent amount of questions on stuff that's not in my lecture. Only because, you know, time constraints. You know, I can't cover everything, yeah. Which is why I really encourage you all to read the stuff and write down notes and what's not clear so I can go in detail now in lecture. Yeah. What about in regards to topics, like mood disorders versus like the, you know, like neuro side? So the neuro side, I'll probably just ask you like the functional neuroanatomy. You know, I'm gonna ask you like, what does frontal lobe do? You know, basic stuff. So is it specifically um, just like definition or is it like context uh, when it comes to a patient? Like you mentioned uh, your patient uh, with the uh, 1A2 substrate and coffee and uh, fluvoxamine. Like, are you going to- A little bit of both. No, a little bit of both. Yeah. Honestly, I, I want you- So as you guys progress, there's going to be less definition because I want you guys to apply knowledge instead of just like memorizing stuff. So there's many different concepts that you guys will have to juggle, right? Pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. If you can understand those concepts and read the clinical questions, you'll be able to figure out the answer. All right. Maybe this first exam might have a little bit more definition questions than the other ones, but eventually it's going to be mostly clinical questions. Which I think will benefit you, you know, in your practice. How do you suggest to study? I mean, um... I'm not really like an auditory learner. I'm like visual and context. So um, I tend to read like case studies on yeah. like patients. And uh, so would you, would that help? Case studies would help. Yeah. I mean, case studies, but a good foundation on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, right? You can always replace that. Yeah. Case studies would help. Yeah. Because you need to learn how to think critically with, you know, every, in the, the thing about psych that's good is when you're practicing, Every patient is kind of like a puzzle, right? There's so many pieces and you have to figure out where does pharmacotherapy play in this? Where does, you know, medications play into this, right? Because you can be part of a team depending on, so you need to really understand how does the whole picture work, right? Because at the end of the day, at least where I work, you know, the prescribers, the psychiatrists and the nurse practitioners, we're, the, we're kind of the captain of the ship, right? You have to make sure that the therapist is providing appropriate therapy, right? You have to make sure that a lot of things are in place also. So you need to have a good understanding of how everything interplays. And the medicine part, you guys, are you, are you guys surprised there's a lot of medicine inside? Because you need to distinguish what could be a possible medical disorder that you need to rule out, right? Is it PCOS? They don't have a period. They gain a lot of weight. They have acne, right? They're, you know, they're, they're irritable. They have anxiety. Is it um, obstructive sleep apnea, right? A guy comes to your office, he's snoring at night, his wife is complaining and he has no neck. Right? Is it obstructive sleep apnea? Is it, you know, other things? You know, there's many different, you know, is it hypothyroidism? Right? Patient has issues with tolerating, you know, cold weather. They get cold very easily, right? They have very brittle skin, you know, changes in hair. There's all these things that you need to rule out. And you're working with other specialists at the same time, but you should have a general idea of what's happening also.
as far as like mechanisms of action, I like in the stall book, some of them get down to like the really nitty gritty. You, you got like cert and that some like with the Sigma blockade and all that. Should we know like very in detail the mechanism for each drug of or? Of course, of course. Yeah, you have to. Ask me a medication. Same medication, same one. I don't know anyone specific at the moment. I was just reading. I know, but just, reading. just, I'm going to give you an example of what I expect you guys to know. Just give me an example. Give me a medication. Say a name. Anyone. Say a medication. Zoloft. Uh, Zoloft, yeah. right? So this is how you guys should know it. Zoloft is an SSRI, right? That is caused more GI side effects, right? It's metabolized by 2C19, 2B6, 3A4, right? Could be used for anxiety. Could be used for GAD. It's also approved for OCD. Give me another medication. Wellbutrin. 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 It's a dopamine norepinephrine uptake inhibitor. It's metabolized by 2B6. All right. Doesn't cause weight gain. Um, is a is a good medication for depression. It doesn't cause sexual dysfunction, right? Could be used, used off label for ADHD. It works on dopamine and norepinephrine and it blocks the dopamine and norepinephrine transport system, increasing dopamine and norepinephrine. Right? Give me another medication. I have a question. Just name a medication. Lexapro. Lexapro. Lexapro is a serotonergic medication, doesn't have large drug interactions, but if you go above 20 milligrams, you have to do an EKG, all right? It's used in kids, pediatric psych, it's FDA approved for kids as young as 12 years old. Um, it tends to be the most tolerable. It does. It's not an inhibitor, it's not an inducer. See what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just, this is how you should know the meds, right? The mechanisms, the pharmacokinetics, what it's used for in a general sense, you know, because you're going to be prescribing medication. So this is how it should be. You could do index cards and write down facts about the medication and what the mechanisms are. Someone tells you the name of the med, you tell me how much you know about it. All right. That's how I used to study. Lithium. You guys can play along. Lithium. You can shout out random facts about lithium. Tell me about lithium. Only med approved for um, suicide. Okay, that's one. It helps with suicidal thoughts and homicidality. What else? For mania. 0 0.6 to 1.2. Good, good. Okay, that's that's the, 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 the therapeutic value. Very good. Mania, yes. It's approved for mania. Yes, and maintenance. What else? Check kidney function. Okay, check kidney function. What else would you check? Thyroid levels. Thyroid. Very good. Thyroid, okay. Calcium oh. level. Calcium, Calcium level. Very good. Very good. Okay. Could it be used in the first trimester of pregnancy? No. no. Why? What does it cost? An anomaly. Yes. Very no good. All plant the trimester valve, right? Epstein's anomaly. Very good. All right. Depakote. Tell me about Depakote. Not a food bound. It's what? Uh, it's highly protein bound. Yeah, good. Uh, it's bound to plasma albumin. Very good. So there could be interactions if someone has low albumin. Good. What's the what's some of the mechanisms? Not approved for um. Mm -hmm. Those of childbearing age. Very good. Very careful. Yeah, do not prescribe, but be very careful with women in childbearing age. Make sure they're on birth control. Okay. Another random fact. FDA approval for bipolar mania. Okay. All right. That's that's true. Yes. Okay. 80 to 160 milligrams. 80 to 120. 80 to 120. 120. 80 to 120. Right. Low is 80, 120. Okay. What else? It should be tapered, not um stop abruptly. Okay, you could have withdrawal seizures if you stop it abruptly, someone's in high dose, that's true, okay. Mm -hmm. It works on channels, right? Sodium, calcium, increases GABA, right? So see what I'm saying? These are things that you guys need to, like like facts about the medication, understand the situations, you know? What about carbamazepine? What do you know about carbamazepine? It's a very strong inducer. Hmm? Strong inducer. Okay, very good. That's important to know. It's a pain inducer, so it induces almost all the SIP enzymes. So you have to adjust those medications. What else? You have to watch for hyponatremia. Hyponatremia, very good, because it causes symptoms of inappropriate ADH. Very good. What else? It induces its own metabolism. Very good. Okay, that's one. Good. Give me another one. Check the HLA-B1502. Excellent. Good, right? Because, you know, it can cause Stevens-Johnson's if someone has HLA-B1502 gene. Very good. What about if you started with Depakote? What do you have to do? Not carbamazepine. I'm sorry. Forget it. What about lamotrigine? That's what I wanted to go to. Lamotrigine. Cool, cool. Tell me about lamotrigine. Does it increase GABA or no? 
Does Lamont need to be hot? No. no, it doesn't. Oh, no, it doesn't. That's why it doesn't work in mania, right? Very good. It works in glutamate. Yes, it works in glutamate. Patient comes to you and they have uh, something on their arm. What do you do? Assess for Steven Johnson syndrome. Yeah, Go good. to urgent care. Go to the ER. <laughs> All right. And if you're combined with um, Depakop, you have to give half dose. Very good. That's it. You gotta Very, have good. Dose. Oh, very good. Tell me about olanzapine. It has metabolic, strong metabolic effects like weight gain. All right. It's metabolized by 1A2342D6. All right. Um, so since it's metabolized by 1A2, if someone smokes cigarettes, 1A2 induction can lower alanzapine levels. All right. Like you said, it's metabolic cause people to gain weight. It can cause sedation. It's a very strong antihistamine. It's a 5HC2C antagonist, which also affects weight. All right. It's used for bipolar mania. Um antagonist. It's an antagonist of 5HC2A and dopamine. Yep. Very good. What else? Olanzapine and um, Prozac can be used for bipolar depression. Very good. Right? It's FDA approved. Symbiax, bipolar depression. Yep. Disrupts leptin and ghrelin. Yeah, yep, it does. Because of 5 C2C and antihistamine properties, right? There you go. You guys are sharp. You guys should all get 100 on the test. I don't expect any less. Yeah, if we take I'm it just... collectively. Uh -huh. <laughs> but if we take it collectively. Yeah. yeah. And with our notes in front of us. You guys will be fine. You guys will be fine. Trust me. You'll be all right. Just uh, one more question. Um, yeah. I think it was while I was reading Trazodone. And um, from my memory, I believe it is a serotonin um, antagonizer. So it seemed a little counterintuitive how it brings about its antidepressant effect because if it's blocking serotonin, you know, like I would imagine people, or someone who's taking trazodone will be more depressed due to the decrease of serotonin. So there's like 16 serotonin receptors. So increasing serotonin with some receptors might do the opposite, right? Or blocking some would actually work. So talking about trazodone, so trazodone is considered a, um, So it's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor at high doses. It's also antihistamine. So at 50 milligrams, it's strong antihistamine. So we use it for sleep, right? So it's a 5-HT1A partial agonist. So 5-HT1A will increase dopamine. So it increases dopamine a little bit, right? As you go up in dose, um, you know, it's more serotonergic. So it's a 5-HT2A antagonist. Like you said, it's a blocker. But what is 5-HT2A? 5-HT2A actually increases dopamine. It's on a GABA interneuron, which we're going to talk about when we talk about psychosis. So you have these GABA interneurons, right? that are in between certain synapses. So what happens if serotonin hits the GABA interneuron? It's gonna tell GABA to tell the presynaptic neuron to not secrete whatever neurotransmitter it is, right? So what happens when you block the 5 c 2 a in the GABA interneuron? It's gonna shut off the GABA interneuron. So when you shut off that GABA interneuron, what is GABA? Inhibits, right? So there's nothing to inhibit, so you're telling that presynaptic neuron to increase dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, if that makes sense. So to answer your question, if you were just looking at it in a very basic sense, Serato increase serotonin, increase mood. It depends on the serotonin receptor, right? You have 5-HT1A, you have 5-HT2A, you have 5-HT3, 5-HTC, 5-HT7, 1B, 1D serotonin, right? There's so many different serotonin receptors. Depending on which one you're talking about, it does different things. So at a low dose, at 50 milligrams, trazodone is not, is not an antidepressant dose. It's mainly just antihistamine, all right? That's why we use it for sleep, 50 milligrams. Once you go above 100 or 150, there is some serotonergic there. It's a stronger 5 c 2 a antagonist. Like I said, increased dopamine. It's more of a serotonin transport reuptake inhibitor, which increases serotonin. It's a 5 c one a partial agonist, which increases dopamine, right? And it's also um, an alpha-2 antagonist. Uh, I'm sorry, an alpha blocker, alpha blocker, which helps with anxiety, right? You block alpha receptors. Someone doesn't have a sympathetic response. It kind of calms them down, right? Does that make sense? So you have to like break it down based on the receptor. You can't just make a blanket statement. So it depends on which receptor, right? So the receptor you're talking about is 5 c 2 a 5 c 2 a antagonist, which is on a GABA interneuron, which increases dopamine. 
I'll go to one o'clock if you guys want. These are good questions. So these are some stuff that we didn't talk about in a lecture. So if you're curious about the other men, we can talk about. <clears throat> we didn't talk about mirtazapine. Mirtazapine is similar to trazodone, right? The, as you raise the dose, it's it's called a NASA. NASA stands for, not NASA that goes into space, norepinephrine antagonist and specific serotonin antagonist. So it's an alpha-2 antagonist. Right, alpha two antagonist is also an autoreceptor. You have an alpha two on a norepinephrine neuron. When you block the alpha two on the on norepinephrine neuron, increase norepinephrine, right? But it's also a hetero. I'm sure you read that in the stop book. Hetero receptor. Hetero means that it's a serotonin neuron with a norepinephrine receptor on it as an autoreceptor. So when you block the alpha two that's on a serotonin receptor, it increases serotonin release also. All right, and as you go higher, of course, it becomes serotonergic. So technically. Mirtazapine works all three neurotransmitters. It's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's an alpha 2A antagonist, which increases dopamine, right? It also works at the heteroreceptor with alpha 2A, which increases serotonin. So increase norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. You get, you get the triple reuptake almost with uh, mirtazapine. But it's, it's a very strong 5-HC2C antagonist and antihistamine. So what's the downside? Weight gain. Helps with appetite because it's a 5-HC3 antagonist. Which, you know, Zofran is a 5 hc 3 antagonist, right? So you give some mirtazapine who has depression with nausea, it might help them eat. But what happens if you keep them on it for too long? They'll overeat, right? And they might gain some weight. So you might have to stop it. See how I'm linking receptors and mechanisms of action to treatments with the patients? That's how it should be. That's why you're a specialist, right? That's why you're going to get paid the big bucks when you guys graduate. It's not as easy as reading a book and saying this is this and this is that. Right, you have to be able to figure out interactions. There's some providers that don't, don't want to say any names that don't have an understanding of it the way I'm explaining it to you guys. They're just prescribing based on algorithms. Trust me, that only you only get so far with that. Eventually, your patients will see through you and those, those patients will fire you and go to someone else. You mentioned sigma agonist, Stephen. Sigma agonist is a, is a good is a good mechanism because when you agonize the sigma receptor, it actually increases neuroplasticity. So a lot of like our, our meds or treatments like psychedelics, um, ketamine, um, they are NAMD antagonists, but they also work on, on sigma receptor also. And there's a new medicine called Ovelity, which is dextromethorphan with Wellbutrin. The Wellbutrin is there as a inhibitor. So it's a pharmacokinetic interaction, which increases dextromethorphan. Because you can give someone dextromethorphan, it's in cough medicine. Right, but the half life is so short that it doesn't work, and people can abuse it because dextorphan gets converted to S uh, dextorphan, which is actually an abusable medication that can cause psychosis. So by giving them Wellbutrin, you're, you're prolonging the half life and you're stopping the conversion of dextromethorphan to dextorphan, which could be abused, and you're giving them an antipsychotic effect, which is an NMD antagonist and a sigma agonist. So that's a new class of medication. That's not going to be in the test. That's that's new, but just just something to be exciting about. So this class used to be six weeks. So I was teaching the same material to students who had to get it done in six weeks. You guys have extra time actually. So if those students were able to do it in six weeks, you guys could do it in 16 weeks. So we should really be focusing on like mechanism of action, like what it's affecting, like what SIP it's associated with. Um, awesome. Because I feel like there's like so much information and it's like, I don't want to study the wrong thing or like, you know, oh, what you mentioned is right. Yeah, you should know. Yeah, you should know the SIP enzymes, the mechanisms of action, the pharmacokinetics. Mm -hmm. You should know that. Anything else, but like specifically that we should know? Uh, and some of neuroanatomy stuff, but it's going to be mostly medications. Yeah. Like I said, this is going to be the hardest class you've ever taken in your life. But once you once you've passed it, you'll feel great. Trust me.
What's up, Robert? So if you guys don't know, Robert hit me up on LinkedIn like a year ago and was like, I got into the Stony Book program. And I told him like, you're gonna have to get through me to pass the program. I'm the gatekeeper. If you can't pass my psycho farm class, you're not practicing. How does it feel, Robert? Were you expecting this? Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a question about um, like some of the things that you were mentioning. I feel like the style book goes very heavily into mechanism of action, mm -hmm. um, but not some of the other stuff that you were mentioning. And even the, um, the other book, the Rutledge book mm -hmm. doesn't okay. go into some of those things. Like some of the things that you want us to know about the medications, is there another source for us or is there one book in particular that has like a better comprehensive view of these? Oh, medications? Those books should be sufficient. So we're pulling questions from both books. So if you can actually understand the style stuff, the other book is much easier, actually. Yeah. Because the style is more detailed. So if you can understand the style stuff, the, the other book is easy. Okay. How long should our um, <clears throat> case study uh, be, like, answer-wise, like, I mean, as long as you answer, as long as you answer the question, I'm not going to penalize you for it being short. But you, but make sure you cite the evidence. Okay. You got it. it. Doesn't have to be that long. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do you want a reference page for the the case yes. study? Yeah, it has to be APA format. Yeah. And we have to respond to other people's posts. Yes, you do. Have you guys watched the other YouTube videos that I had from last semester? Good. Yeah, you're catching up. So sometimes it repeats stuff, sometimes it adds stuff. I mean, the material is so vast, it's very hard for me to like, you know, cover everything. So it's really up to you guys to like, you know, steer me in the right direction of what's not clear so I can kind of go into detail about it. The 48 hours that you're opening the exam, is it on Wednesday and Thursday or Tuesday and Wednesday? Uh, we haven't decided yet. You guys tell me. Does it matter for you if it's Wednesday, Thursday or Tuesday, Wednesday? Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday, Thursday. I wonder, I'm going to find out if we can make it just 48 hours once you open it. I mean, I don't, I'm sorry. No, that doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me find out. Let me find out. We can't have, we can't have it open for forty eight hours straight because once you start to test, the countdown starts. So, yeah. Is it um the format? Can you go back? Is it backtracking or no backtracking? That's a good question. Like if I didn't know question two, then maybe I want to give my brain some time to think about it and move on to the next one, and then be able to go back. Do you guys want backtracking? Yes. 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 It's closed book, right? Yeah. Do you feel the questions for, um, the NEI program are good practice or like indicative of how test questions can be or not really? Because uh, I started going through some of them and yeah, I'm just wondering. Yeah, uh, this, yeah, they are, yeah, they are. But NEI, remember, is is not for just NPs, it's for psychiatrists too. So some yeah. of the questions might be a little bit more, even though I'm, I'm for that, I, I like the, the very complicated questions, but to spare you guys the misery, I, I don't ask the NEI very complicated questions. Yeah. Gotcha. But, if you, but if you can answer them and you understand them, that's more power to you, right? Especially early on in your career. I like the Ronnie Coleman approach. It's like weightlifting. You just lift 500 pounds automatically. Just lift it. No warm up. Just lift it. Just push it up. Be fine.
Three minutes, if you have any other questions, please ask. Do you know where in any of the textbooks the brain outlines are to go over pathways? Because it's not necessarily in what was listed in the reading yeah. assignment, but if I can find it a little better. Uh, I don't know, to be honest with you, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. But I mean, if you if you just watch the videos that I have, you can just kind of see the pathways. I mean, you know, I'm okay. not going to have to draw like a, you don't have to draw a hippocampus for me on the test. Let's have a general okay. understanding. Let's have a general understanding. Yeah. Basically, what we reviewed is kind yeah. of areas that we're going into. Okay. Thank you. Like, how does the pathways, like what pathways are more in like, you know, for example, Shrinking of hippocampus, inflammation, that's all linked in depression, right? Hyperfiring amygdala, even though we're not talking about anxiety now, that could be anxiety, you know, know how increased stress happens because it's an overproduction of cortisol, which causes cortisol receptors in your brain to kind of downregulate and desensitize. Therefore, that long term will cause shrinkage of your hippocampus, right? Know that long term stressors can also cause your blood brain barrier to kind of increase in permeability, which can cause some of your white blood cell counts to leak through. And your body doesn't want white blood cell counts in your brain because your white blood cells might attack some of your neurons and kill them off. So that's also one of the hypotheses. All right. And of course, the nor norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin depletion is one of the earlier, you know, hypotheses of depression, even though it's kind of not really used as much, but that's still one of them. All right. Well, good luck, everybody. I'm going to speak to Professor Smith about adding a back button so you guys can go back. All right. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me. All right. Have a nice weekend. Thank Instead you. of watching uh, romantic comedies tonight, maybe you guys can watch my YouTube video back to back. Get my views up a little bit. I'm just kidding. You don't have to. Take care. Thank you.